Okay, hello everyone. My name is Tom Krebs. I'm the academic director at the Forum New Economy, and I'm delighted to welcome Mariana Matsukato and Wolfgang Schmidt as our speakers today. Uh, the plan is that Mariana will start with a 20 minutes input, and after that, uh, Wolfgang will comment uh, and, and, and broaden additionally the pers policies perspective. And you can answer questions. You can send us all your questions actually via the, uh, via the Q and Q and I functions. And uh, then we will we'll follow up with a long discussion. So Mariana Matsukato is a professor at UCL and she is the director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Process, Purpose. And in her latest book, uh, Mission Economy, a moonshot uh, guide to changing capitalism, and she made the point that we have to rethink uh, the way we, 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 we conceive of government and the role of government, and that we or, we, or policy policymakers should adopt a mission-oriented approach to policymaking. And um, this book, and generally Mariana had a high, uh, was highly influential in, in policy circles, had a major impact on policymaking, uh, in Europe, all over the world, um, but I think mainly also uh, particularly in Europe and also in Germany, as I might add, uh, for example, um, the most likely soon to be Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, campaigned um, on uh, this mission oriented approach. He had two cornerstones in his campaign. One was respect for everybody and the other one was mission, uh, mission oriented approach to policy making. So obviously, um, all over the world, this is an interesting issue, but particularly in Germany, we are very eager to learn and hear from Mariana. Mariana, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor to be speaking to you all about uh, how this mission-oriented approach is or could be really relevant, not just in Europe, but for you know countries like Germany that I think have been um, victim in some ways to the wrong diagnosis um, in terms of what the problems are in Europe, because we should remember, of course, Germany is a, is a key uh, country in Europe and the relationship between the member states in Europe, you know, pre-COVID uh, and post-financial crisis were, you know, quite tense. And so what I'd like to really focus on is why this current moment that we're living through in Europe is a really exciting one, potentially. And we have to be extremely careful not to waste it, both in terms of how to direct this new stimulus program called the Next Gen EU uh, program, uh, but also in terms of how to really kind of bring back a level of solidarity and discussion within Europe of what our kind of distinct uh, type of growth that we want to uh, have is and why we need to, again, have a different diagnosis of why we have differences between European countries in terms of competitiveness, in terms of also strategies at the corporate level, at the national level, and what it would look like to bring that discussion about heterogeneity and differences between countries to the table right now when we're thinking about a, a Build Back Better uh, recovery program. So first, um, in the book, I kind of begin with this uh, message, which is, you know, we can't keep going from crisis to crisis to crisis. The, um, the COVID crisis has really highlighted just how ill-prepared we have been in terms of delivering pretty basic things. <laughs> you know, it's not enough to have a vaccine if everyone doesn't have it globally. Uh, so in terms of kind of global access to the benefits of technological change, there's six vaccines out there, but as Dr. Tedros says, we have vaccine apartheid, where 80% of the doses are being hoarded by 10% of the countries. We also woke up to the fact that it's not just about technology, but it's the ability um, you know, globally to manufacture and to have capacity uh, to deliver and to produce. And you know, huge wake up call in terms of the need to revive kind of global industrial strategies for that, um, in terms of also kind of a more distributed manufacturing capability. But also, again, huge wake up call in terms of things like the digital divide. Um, you know, I've got four kids, they all had access to their human right to education during the lockdown, but so many school children haven't and in Europe, but also in London where I live uh, and globally, especially if we look at the global south, there's a really, real big problem in terms of this digital divide, which is only increasing inequality in periods like a lockdown. Anyway, that of course is happening on the back of the climate crisis where we had, you know, a 16 year old uh, Greta Thornburg telling us all uh, two years ago, now she's 18 that uh, you know what do you do when your house is on fire 
you get out, you don't sit there and debate, should I stay, should I go? And you know that kind of level of urgency, of course, has been in all the IPCC reports, including this one this past August. And yet, if you look at all the figures, um, including how we're using the COVID-19 recovery funding right now, we're simply not moving fast. Something like 56% of the recovery funds have continued to go to a fossil fuel uh, generated project. So, you know, the climate crisis, but of course, also the financial crisis. You know, there's these kind of multiple types of crises interweaving. And the financial crisis, what was so disappointing, really, in terms of how we globally interacted with it, is we just kind of, you know, in, how do you say, in, increase the liquidity into the system to save capitalism from falling apart back then. And most of that finance, honestly, has just gone back to the financial sector. In the UK, for example, where I've been looking a lot at the structure of finance, something like 80% of finance goes back to the financial sector. But, you know, that level of kind of liquidity um, and recovery plans that happened back then, they didn't use the word recovery plans like we uh, use it now, but it was very much a, a moment of, you know, injection of, of money into the system, unless it has a direction and unless it's a, um, accompanied by real kind of ambitious fiscal stimulus, that's what happened. Finance just finds its way back to the financial sector. So, you know, that's the context. Um, now, one of the things I just wanted to raise is that back then, back in the time of the financial crisis, one of the biggest mistakes we made in Europe <laughs> was that our own recovery plan was conditional on different member states actually cutting their deficits. And I won't go into the details of that, but you'll remember the kind of big uh, debate between Greece, you know, Holland, uh, Germany, in terms of what the actual conditions should be, as opposed to the ones that we had where countries like, you know, Spain ended up cutting their publicly funded R&D uh, by 40% in order to stick to these very stringent deficit rules that accompanied the European kind of bailout schemes. Now, this time around, it's, it's, it's very different. And, you know, this is what I want to argue, which is that this time around, it seems like we're sort of waking up. Uh, the whole kind of notion of build back better is out there. And, you know, that basically means directing the recovery program. But this is going to be wasted unless we really kind of get our hands dirty with what that means. And what I mean by this is a different moment is, you know, if you look at the next gen EU recovery plan, which is uh, uh, about 2 trillion euros, this time around, it's conditional on investment. It's actually, you know, investment that has a direction around climate and around digitalization. Um, there's also a whole separate pot related to health investments. And that's very important to see health as an investment and not an expenditure on the back of a health crisis, which has been much worse than it had to be given the underfinancing of global health systems. But this next gen EU moment um, has really important implications with what has to happen on the ground. And I wanted to really kind of use my book to think about that. First of all, um, just kind of to backtrack a moment, one of the things that's been missing in the European dialogue is that these differences that I talked about my opening um, remark about the differences between European countries, you know, why Germany has a more uh, dynamic, say, uh, 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 ecosystem of innovation and of middle sized uh, uh, companies that continue to produce the kind of, you know, uh, products that the world wants to buy um, is not a uh, outcome of Germany having kind of been more efficient and stringent with its public um, budget, it's actually because it has been making very much the kinds of investments and has the kinds of structures, which in many parts of Europe, we don't have, um, you know, Italy, where I'm from, we don't have Fraunhofer centers. Uh, we have a public bank, you know, like the KFW called Casa Depositi Prestiti, but it ends up being to a large extent, a handout machine. It hasn't really been kind of central to the innovation ecosystem. Um, we don't have very strong vocational training for workers and apprenticeship programs like Germany does. We don't have Max Planck institutes and we invest much less than Germany does on both education and R&D, public and private R&D. And, you know, Germany is not perfect, but the point is that these differences within Europe of what I would call the national innovation system in the underlying structure of different types of public organizations like public banks, science industry linkages like Fraunhofer centers, et cetera, this is the moment to really gain 
uh, like almost to do a, an inventory of, you know, what do we know works, what doesn't work, and what is that kind of decentralized network of different public and private actors that are so important across the whole investment, production, and innovation chain, which we know is critical to competitiveness. It's critical to investment-led growth. It's critical to innovation-led growth, let alone then directing that innovation and investment towards really important challenges like digitalization, uh, climate, and stronger health systems. So this is a moment to step back from that ideology that we've unfortunately had for a long time. And again, I always go back to that post-financial crisis moment that we wasted to actually really think, you know, given that we have this next gen EU budget, which is conditional on investment, what is our knowledge about the kinds of institutions that are important to actually have ambitious, strategic, mission-oriented investment and really, um, uh, which I'll explain what I mean by mission-oriented in a second, but especially to design these kind of public-private partnerships, uh, which are of course needed. It's not about the state or business, but the partnership between public and private. How do we actually design that in particular ways so that when all this money lands, right, the next gen EU budget lands at the member state level, it's landing on able, capable, dynamic, creative, uh, you know, uh, public and private institutions. And unfortunately, if we don't do that, <laughs> the money again will end up, you know, in some useless parts of the economy. And we shouldn't forget, by the way, that many countries, including Italy, uh, you know, pre-COVID um, and for the last decade, sometimes haven't been able even to use the European funds because of that lack of implementation capacity on the ground. So it's not enough to create more finance, to create more stimulus if we don't pay attention to the nitty gritty. And so what I talk about in uh, my book called Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to uh, Changing Capitalism, is that we need a new framing. We have to stop thinking in this kind of dichotomous way that it's either austerity or invest, invest, interest rates are low, just invest in infrastructure and everything will be okay, right? That if you go back to that moon landing approach 51 years ago, there's something about how we had a really strong direction from the state. It was very purpose oriented. It was very clear on what the goal was, but the kind of way in which public and private work together was very much part of the reason why that mission itself was so successful, both in terms of achieving it, but especially in terms of all those dynamic spillovers that happened along the way. So literally the multiplier effect, each pound or dollar or euro of public money, the degree to which it actually catalyzes investment-led, innovation-led growth matters in terms of how, you know, how the, the direction is being set and how the tools on the ground, like innovation policy, procurement policy, and so on, procurement policy and so on are actually designed. And what was interesting about that, that moon landing, the Apollo program, if I can just bore you a bit on this because I became a bit of nerd about it and then I'll go back to uh, you know, Germany in a second, is what I found really interesting were kind of three or four things. First of all, the language, you know, Kennedy was so clear, we're doing this because it's hard, you know, it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna cost a huge amount of money and we're probably gonna screw up along the way, but it's okay because, you know, we've set this mission and we're gonna complete it. But that language of difficulty, admitting that it was gonna be hard and not easy, that is completely missing from the kind of policy uh, vocabulary today. In fact, you know, in Italian, facile or Latin means easy. And that's the words we use. We say, we're gonna facilitate. Policy is there to facilitate, for example, business or some other actors to operate, as opposed to, we are going to embrace the uncertainty, the risk-taking, the difficulties we have with climate, digitalization, strengthening global health systems together. First point. Second point, they really cared about organizational design. You know, on the back of the Apollo 1 fire, one of the first things they did was reorganize NASA. They realized that to be purpose-oriented, you know, if you actually care about getting stuff done, your organization needs to reflect that. And at the time, they were very kind of top down and vertical. And one of the astronauts who died on the Apollo um, for, for the Apollo on fire, Gus Grissom, before dying, he yelled out, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Because he couldn't hear what was being said to him uh, from the mission control room. And what they did on the back of that tragedy was they reorganized NASA with different kind of project managers, each with their teams, but constant horizontal communication between those teams. They realized that they needed to have an agile, flexible system where each department was working between silos, not within their silos. And think of all the 
complaints we hear about governments, you know, that they're too bureaucratic, every department is within its own little blind alley. Well, yes, that's a problem. But the reason that we need to change that is precisely because if we care to solve problems, we need that interdepartmental uh, interaction and especially an intersectoral one. Because to get to the moon, it wasn't just aerospace. It required huge amounts of investment and innovation across sectors in the business community as different as nutrition, electronics, materials. Um, uh, uh, well, obviously, aerospace software, the whole software industry in some ways was a outcome of that moon landing. And I recommend everyone watch Hidden Figures about how it was, to a large extent, African-American women who were the data scientists and the uh, you know, software engineers, as, as we would call them today. Um, and you know, that kind of level of intersectoral collaboration to solve a problem, how relevant is that today where climate requires so much investment and innovation in, again, areas as our transport systems, construction, nutrition, of course, renewable energy, but literally how we produce, how we distribute and how we consume. It can't be seen as like something just that the Department of Energy is going to have to solve. This has to go to the center of the Treasury itself. And I'd love to speak to Wolfgang about some of the bottlenecks in Germany and other countries about how the Treasury continues with its old ways of thinking about the economy, economic growth and economic theory. And then yet we have some kind of funky things being talked about in the Department of Health and Energy and Innovation, unless that is actually brought at the center of how we think about growth, the direction and the rate of growth that will always be a peripheral activity, areas like climate, health and digitalization. And that was very much at the center of how NASA thought going across departments. Um, and another thing that was so interesting, two quick things, is the first thing they did was redesign procurement. And if you think of the, you know, the European Commission kind of uh, uh, problems that they face with procurement policy around the vaccine. This is such a stark wake up call. They like almost like a prize scheme, like here's something we need to do, here's the price, you know, kind of like, like a prize, but then with constant incentives, bonuses for, you know, quality improvement and innovation. So that attention to something as kind of nerdy as procurement policy to get to the moon, uh, you know, as that famous saying of, you know, yeah, getting to the moon is easier than kind of dealing with the paperwork <laughs> uh, along the way, that need to actually design the procurement, the innovation, the contracts in such a way that we're as ambitious as the policy objective itself is just, again, a huge, I think, awakening moment right now with COVID-19, but also for any country that cares also nationally to solve big problems. What does it mean for that kind of nitty gritty issue? And another thing they had, which was, again, so fascinating, and this is Ernest Brackett, by the way, who was a head of procurement with Apollo 11, he said, and if we ourselves become stupid within NASA, we won't even know who to collaborate with in the business sector. And we're going to get captured by brochuremanship, he said, um, you know, because at the time they didn't have PowerPoints, they had brochures and companies would come in and say, work with me. And he said, we won't even know who to work with or how to write the terms of reference if we ourselves within the civil service, within this public entity, NASA, aren't intelligent ourselves. And here again, the wake up call is if we see on the back of you know, so many different crises, financial, climate, Brexit, uh, you know, health, just how much companies, sorry, countries have actually been outsourcing their capabilities uh, to diff different types of actors and kind of missing that trick of investing also within the state itself to be a dynamic, creative bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, to, to build what we call in the Institute I direct in London, the dynamic capabilities of the public sector. Uh, my new book is actually looking at this in terms of just how much uh, money is being spent on the McKinsey's, the PricewaterhouseCoopers, the Deloitte's, uh, you know, by governments worldwide and what they're missing out in terms of really investing also within their own brains and capacity. Another really interesting thing is they had a, a part of the contracts with the business sector, because again, lots of different businesses worked with NASA to get us to the moon. Um, they had a no excess profits clause which was so interesting, right? Because this is all about collectively creating value, collectively investing, collectively innovating for a common purpose. Well, what does that then mean also for the sharing of the rewards, you know, to make sure that it doesn't become kind of like a gambling casino, as I would argue we have today in space where it's become kind of a billionaire's uh, you know, playground. Um, and so what the mission approach does is it kind of brings all this thinking together. It says, look, every country, 
has signed up to the sustainable development goals. These are broad challenges, right? They're challenges like the space race was, <laughs> but you can't stop there. You know, had a Kennedy stopped at beat the Russians, space race, nothing would have happened. How do we transform these challenges and the talk behind inclusive, sustainable, smart growth, which we've had in Europe for such a long time, but specifically the SDG goals, which are broad challenges around hunger, poverty, inequality, uh, you know, climate change, digitalization, gender parity. How do we transform them into really bold missions that bring together lots of different sectors, just like the moon landing was not just aerospace, and then pay attention to how to redesign industrial strategy, procurement policy, innovation strategy to really galvanize as much bottom up um, uh, creativity and innovation and experimentation as both Kennedy and Roosevelt. Roosevelt also always said experiment, experiment, experiment as possible. And you know, yes, it costs money, but by actually organizing this in such a way that does stimulate and crowd in other types of finance, other types of activity, other types of investment, it's not about you know, public budgets or private sector investment and obsessing about one or the other. It really is about setting that kind of direction for change, which I repeat, the next gen EU budget, at least in our uh, region, provides us the opportunity for. And then getting, you know, getting our hands dirty with the details of transforming challenges into missions like a climate neutral city or globally getting the plastic out of the ocean or at the level of a city like London fighting knife crime, you know, a zero knife crime strategy, not a bad idea. And getting many different sectors involved in that, but doing it by, again, getting our hands dirty with things like you know, uh, na like how NASA did with redesigning its procurement policy. And another thing that's really important, and I think in the German context, it's, it's interesting, is that this can only also be done with a different social contract between business and the state. And there's lots of talk about things like the Green Deal. And, you know, as Greta says, the green bit, listen to the science, but the deal bit needs a new social contract. And there's an opportunity now to learn from the COVID-19 recovery funds and how they've been implemented in some countries about really introducing conditionality in order to seriously build back better in such a way that goes beyond the usual hype and kind of Davos talk about stakeholder value and purpose and gives it a real kind of concrete angle. And in France, for example, the Minister of Finance created, the Ministry of Finance created strong conditionality for the bailouts or recovery funds, if you want, that went to Air France and to Renault. They had to commit during the COVID period to reducing their carbon emissions in the next five years in order to be able to access that recovery uh, budget. Whereas in the UK, we just gave 600 million to EasyJet, no conditions attached. Uh, some countries like Austria and Denmark have put conditions attached to not avoiding tax. You know, if you are used to using tax havens, sorry, <laughs> go to the end of the line in terms of the COVID-19 recovery. In the US, Elizabeth Warren, even pre-Biden, she made a condition or tried to in the Coronavirus Care Act um, to create a condition where profits had to be reinvested back into the economy, precisely reflecting that profits in the business community are an outcome of a huge amount of social benefits and social infrastructure and this level of hoarding that we've seen in the last two decades by many large businesses, but also the overuse of things like share buybacks for a trillion dollars have been used by the uh, Fortune 500 companies to buy back their shares to boost stock prices, stock options, executive pay in the last 10 years. What does it mean to create conditionality on reinvestment of profits back into the economy, not hoarding, not just you know handing back to shareholders, but also directing, again, that kind of public-private co-investment towards a, uh, um, uh, these kind of goals that I was talking about before. And the reason I said it's interesting for Germany, and this is my last uh, statement, then I'll stop, is that there's something about what Germany has done also in recent years on the back of the Energiewende program that I think is so interesting, and there's real lessons there. When the steel sector you know, begged for money, as steel is asking for everywhere, because steel is in crisis, um, I just found it very interesting that the loans that were provided were conditional on steel lowering its material content, which it then did with repurpose, reuse, recycle technology across the whole production chain. So steel in Germany, but also in Sweden today, is much greener than steel in other countries where they just get a bailout to basically stay in place. So how to, again, bring that kind of conditionality around transformation, around really building back better and steering an economy towards a more inclusive, sustainable type of growth trajectory 
is not only important, but it has to be embedded within the contracts themselves, not just procurement that I mentioned, but also things like bailouts or recovery funds or the way that a public bank like the KFW provides um, loans. And again, I think these are the lessons that we should be uh, learning on the back of not just COVID-19, but also the failed <laughs> recovery after the financial crisis and the real urgency that we have today, you know, just two weeks or one week before COP26. Um, anyway, thank you so much and really keen to have a dialogue now. Great. And thank you, Mariana, for this uh, very stimulating and, and insightful talk. Um, lots of things to chew on and lots of things to discuss. Um, I already mentioned in my introductory remarks uh, that um, this mission-oriented policy making, this idea, was used uh, by Olaf Scholz and his campaign, and actually quite a bit. And so it's very fitting and, and, uh, that we have Wolfgang Schmidt today here, uh, who's a close advisor to Olaf Scholz, I, I think I can say, and he is also, in a, sort, in a sense, uh, one of the architects behind the, the campaign. But he's also the deputy finance minister, so he can also speak about policy making. So the floor is yours, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you very much, Mariana and, and Tom, and, and for this opportunity. I think also it comes at the right time, not only your book uh, after COVID, but also this discussions just before we are hopefully forming a new government in Germany. And so we might learn something from this discussion. Um, I, I found it very interesting um, reading in your book and also uh, listening to you now to, to see um, how much we can actually learn from COVID. And I just want to add for, for a few seconds something before I come to Germany and the election, because I also felt that um, that COVID both proved how, how strong, especially the European Union's welfare states are, but also the weaknesses. Um, and, and I definitely think and hope that we can learn from them. So maybe just one element um, that, that really showed me also what this kind of cooperation, a very tiny mission could be, um, when we had the procurement problem with PPE, the, the personal protective equipment, especially masks, um, we realized that, that we have no production uh, of these materials in Europe. So everybody turned to China. Um, we used a traditional approach and said, okay, we have several uh, entities in the German government that are responsible for procurement. We only realized that they had no idea how to procure anything in China. They had no idea of the Chinese market of institutions. So then um, we came up with the idea, okay, let's turn to companies and ask them for help. And we had, I think, an ideal example of cooperation between private companies that had for a very long time been active in China, knew every single um, producer um, and, and the state. And we put them all together um, and they only had one mission, um, buy and procure as many um, masks and other PPE equipment as possible. And that really worked. Um, and then we started to incentivize production in Germany. So that shows you that, that even in, the, in this tiny element, if you, uh, if you apply a mission-oriented way of, um, of, of working, using procurement policies, uh, using very agile um, entities and making private and public um, actors work together that it, it can work. But obviously it was in a very peculiar situation where um, money did not play any role and it was clear that we need to do something. The same is then true for vaccines and maybe we can get into that later because I think it's also a, a, a good example of both what went wrong and also what can be learned. Um, but to come to, 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 to and, and obviously on Next Generation Euro, I'm happy to talk a lot because I think um, both Olaf Scholz and this ministry played a tiny role in, in, in making it happen and it also shows you how important actually personnel is. Um, so if you have the right minister at the right time or the right chancellor at the right time, it can completely change um, the way um, we act, and if you compare it as you did to the financial crisis, you clearly see the difference uh, and the different approach. So in Germany, and Tom mentioned that um, uh, now we have the election and, and now in the way of forming new government, it is um, an interesting moment because after 16 years with uh, Merkel and her governmental style, I think they were 
good years for Germany, but there is a sense that a, a kind of a new renewal is needed, something like a new start. And now we are trying to figure out how this start can look like. And um, I hope and I think that Mariana's book might have some influence on that. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, the SPD, one of the possible coalition partners, and Olaf Scholz, the possible chancellor, um, really said, okay, we want to, to use Mariana's approach. And we introduced um, uh, the idea of what we call Zukunftsmission and future missions and a mission oriented approach. And, and we divined um, at the end four of these future missions. And the first, obviously, was a climate neutral Germany. Um, and as you said, it is important also to mention the, the size of the challenge. I'm happy that Olaf Scholz always mentioned that this probably is um, the most important transformation that has happened in the last 100 years. And he always put the example that we used 250 years burning coal and oil and gas, and now we have less than 25 years to completely change course, so to become net zero in 2045. So I think this, this sense of urgency and also um, being clear that this is not something that can just happen um, the normal way, but this is the one mission that everybody needs to work together, both in um, government, in civil society, but also in, in the business community, I think is, is, is very important. And the second one is to build the most modern, we put it in very modest terms, the most modern mobility system in Europe. And the third one is obviously digital sovereignty, both in Germany and in the European Union. And the fourth one also as a lesson of, of, of the COVID crisis is update our health system. And even when we discussed this um, within the Social Democratic Party, we realized how difficult it is for many politicians to understand this notion of a mission. Well, there were, there were um, requests to include other things, more traditional social democratic questions and transform it into a mission. But we had to argue and all of had to argue, look, this is really the idea of a mission centered policy that you don't just relabel anything, but that you focus on, on the, really the big challenges and, and try to come up um, with a new form of, of, of uh, challenging them and solving them. And, and this is now the, the interesting time in Germany, uh, the how. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to, to hear also from Mariana, also maybe from uh, best practices from, from other countries, um, more on, on this level, not on the very concrete moonshot um, mission, but on the challenges of our days where you see examples where, where it worked. because. Our feeling is that it, it, it not really passed into flesh and blood yet, um, this mission-centered um, approach. Um, I think we have, and you mentioned in your book and also in, in, other, um, in, in other papers, you mentioned some of the institutions um, that we already have in Germany, uh, like KFW or the high-tech strategy, um, I would probably add, we also, regarding climate, we invented the climate cabinet and, and we have a climate protection law that sets clear goals year by year for each ministry so that we will have a public discourse because there is a, an academic counseling that will take place, stock taking, and so that we can, we can actually start to discuss the achievements of different ministries. But what we clearly see is that the silos that you were talking, um, both within ministries, but also obviously between ministries and ministers are, are there. And so we will have to talk in, in the new um, government about how to overcome these silos. And uh, one thing that, that you realize, it's, it's also about everybody, every minister wants to shine and wants to, to be responsible for the successes. So to, 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 to make everybody understand that it, it is a common endeavor um, is not so easy. So I'm happy to discuss this as well. And it also has some, um, some um, 
consequences for the way the government is set up. And, and you mentioned that in, in your book as well. So the, the question um, that you have capable institutions, both private and, and public ones, I think is, is of utmost importance. And, and when you talk about agile and flexible public institutions, obviously if we, if we confront that with the governmental reality of today's, we see elements of that emerging but um, overall, I think it's, it's fair to say that we are not yet there. So this is a question of how to recruit the right people, not only lawyers like me or some economists like you, um, but also a more diverse um, set of people that, that might help to, to bring other ideas. We have experimented um, with an agency like the Agency for Sprung Innovationen, um, so to kind of leapfrog um, uh, innovations. Um, and then you realize with such an agency, out of a sudden you are confronted with all the bureaucratic um, hurdles that we have on payment of, of, of requirements of, of formal qualifications. So there is a long way to go and I'm happy to hear and to discuss also um, uh, what kind of examples exist um, maybe in the European Union um, where uh, governments uh, achieve that. So I leave it here um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's a great um, uh, moment to discuss these, these questions. Um, thousand things one could say, but we should try to focus on some. I'm looking forward to discussion that. Great. Can I come in, Tom? Yes, or yes. Or okay, great. Uh, Thank okay. you. Yeah, just go ahead and, and sure. Yeah, it's, well, fascinating. And especially, you know, I, I forgot to mention, I, I usually do the PPE example, because as you say, it was a huge failure. We ended up calling, you know, uh, frontline workers essential workers while they were actually dying because they didn't have that personal protection equipment. Um, and we call them essential workers without actually valuing the essential places where they work in terms of that underfinancing globally. Uh, the kind of social infrastructure which has been revealed to be so so important um but you know in italy for example uh we are not famous for having agile flexible bureaucracy and yet um for the same reasons that you mentioned in germany in march um it was march 2020 we were 100 percent dependent on chinese ppe because we then based on the tragedy and you'll remember italy was very much on the front line in terms of the um the early uh, you know, uh, months, um, we managed to become 100% independent within three months by using, again, procurement in a very dynamic way, which is usually only done in military types of occasions. And so we ended up having 137 companies producing all of Italy's PPE through this use of dynamic, innovative procurement methods. And the question is, why do we have to wait for a crisis of this sort where thousands of people are dying? Why can't we normalize that kind of attention to an outcomes-based budgeting and outcomes-based procurement and outcomes-based kind of capability set and so on. And I, again, the lessons are huge. And we actually wrote a report with UNDP, my institute, looking at experiences like that around the world and you know what happened in Kerala, what happened in Vietnam, why were they so much more able actually to deal with this crisis on the back of previous crises that they had like the Nipah virus, which resulted in them doing what many countries unfortunately don't do you know, on the back of crises. They actually invested massively within their public administration precisely around some of these um, tools, but also creating that more trusted relationship between civil society, business, the state, and so on. Um, and you know, your, your question on examples is I think really important one because I truly believe just like we do you know, in business schools where you look at business case studies, you know, what works, what doesn't, all these management theories, we need to pay as much attention to, you know, what works, what doesn't at the level of our public institutions. And because we've dismissed the public sector as at best fixing market failures, at worst get out of the way, but, you know, in Europe, we're a bit more illuminated than say the Tea Party. So we know that public sector is important, but we haven't really thought about it as kind of at the center of value creation. So we haven't invested and really thought about you know, what works, what doesn't, how can we use, again, these tools to really kind of scale up dynamic and innovative uh, activity. 
And first of all, you know, Europe has adopted this mission oriented approach on the back of uh, work that I did with the European Commission for two years, but it's currently kind of siloed within the DG for innovation. So, you know, how do we bring that notion of missions in the way that you were talking about and the book talks about at the center of, you know, of kind of, you know, um, ECFIN as well, but also the cabinet of how we actually steer the Green Deal in concrete ways on the ground. And I, and I think that's very important. So to, again, you know, take uh, the missions out of the silo of just innovation policy and to the center of economic growth policy, both in nation states, but also at the level of the commission and globally, I think it's important. And here are the lessons, I think, uh, I was just thinking about some important ones. One is what's been happening in Sweden. And you know, why is Sweden always one of the examples? Anyway, uh, Sweden is doing something very interesting, which is they have as a broad challenge for the country, a fossil um, free welfare state which is really interesting concept, right? Because a welfare state does a lot of things, right? There's public education, public health, public transport, and so on in terms of really kind of a citizen-centered uh, policy that really thinks about kind of well-being. And then there's, you know, state activity that really tends to be a position more in terms of kind of care, right? But how do we bring care and innovation together in terms of both how we design public education, public health, and public transport, well, a mission-oriented lens can be really useful. So what they've done is they've landed this notion of a fossil-free welfare state at the center of things like school meals. So school meals, which are very important, and again, on the back of COVID-19, extremely important, especially during lockdown, because many kids globally didn't have access to that one meal, at least, that they could get for free at school. But how do we turn it not just into something you get for free, hopefully, uh, through the school, but actually an innovation funnel. So they've um, made school meals have, have a, a mission. They have to be healthy, tasty, not just Ikea meatballs, <laughs> um, and sustainable. So the you know, sustainable production and distribution and consumption of school meals becomes a funnel and a focus for innovation towards a green transition, but also the participatory part. So getting school children involved in that, both learning about it through the curriculum but also potentially designing the meals, just kind of increasing that awareness, inspiration, the co-design, the, you know, this word that sometimes is overly used, but we need to literally co-create and co-design this if it's going to inspire and crowd in lots of different actors. Um, in Camden, the part of London where I live, it's sort of a microcosm of the world, right? We have the best that the 21st century has to offer, my university, you know, uh, the British Library, the British Museum, the Wellcome Trust, and so on, but it's back to back with some of the most deprived neighborhoods like Summerstown, which is very close to St. Pancras and King's Cross. And in Camden, we've been implementing this mission oriented approach very much, much in a place based kind of way. So the carbon neutral kind of clean growth mission is very much kind of focused around some local housing estates, social housing. Um, and bringing resident associations, people living in the social housing to the table in that way to really start with a conversation. What, you know, what, what is the mission? You know, what do we even mean by a green transition? What does living together in a more sustainable way mean so it doesn't just turn into a retrofitting old housing kind of mission? And that's, I think, really important. And by the way, the, um, the theme this year of the Venice Biennale, the architecture Biennale was how do we live together in a more sustainable way. And that really requires a lot of debate and contestation. And we um, co-curated one of the pavilions for the UN with Oliver Elias and myself and Mary Robinson, a wonderful climate activist. And Oliver has this wonderful uh, notion that public space should be a safe place to disagree and to debate. And there's something about that that's really important, which I've learned through the Camden missions, which is that kind of ability to debate and to contest and to argue in a safe way so it's not about harmony. No, debate is good, but to do it in a safe space, there's something about the real need with these missions to create spaces for that. So they're not seen as just some sort of top down thing fed by academics and business leaders and policymakers. And on that, I think it's really important to reflect on the just transition. You know, the labor share of global income is at a record low. The profit share is at a record high. How do we both fight inequality in terms of, you know, making sure that workers globally are, are paid properly and they're actually benefiting per, from productivity increases and have proper negotiating power, but also that they be at the table, not just fighting for a just transition, which is very important to invest in people's ability to adapt as sectors change, but also that the labor voice is at the table ex ante in that design phase and the kind of project planning phase. 
And I think, you know, social movements more broadly, whether we think of Friday for the future, so young people really fighting around climate, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, the labor movement, what does it mean to bring those voices and the movement to the table to design and think about the missions themselves from the start? Um, and lastly, just one of the examples that I've been thinking about, because we worked with Scotland very closely on this, which is um, how do we, you know, precisely because of the importance of institutions like the KFW or the African Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, devise these types of finance, whether it be wealth funds, local wealth funds or national wealth funds or public banks, different types of public funds in a mission oriented way so that we provide patient long term finance, which is very much needed because there's plenty of inpatient finance out there, which causes the financial crisis, um, but also steer that finance in such a way that it really picks the willing. So not a picking winners mentality, which is that old way of thinking that a public finance goes to particular sectors that are in trouble, but really picking those willing to work with a government, whether it's city level, regional, national or international to move towards a different type of growth. And that means that we shouldn't obsess about like SMEs just because you know firms are small, who cares? But if you are small and you know willing and kind of able to move in a particular direction, you're gonna need extra type of finance and, and longer term finance for sure. But the point is you don't focus on these random categories like the size of a firm or a particular sector or particular technology, but really focus on the problem and then provide that finance for those organizations willing to kind of move towards that transition. And that was the example I gave of that kind of interesting change that happened in Germany in terms of how the loans were being uh, provided with that kind of conditionality. And in Scotland, we helped set up a whole new Scottish National Investment Bank very much from scratch because they didn't have one with this kind of idea of a mission oriented uh, public financial institution. So examples like that are important because otherwise we end up romanticizing the role of the state and you know directed finance without getting our hands dirty and what does it mean for the change in ways of thinking of the portfolio, of risks, of rewards, of the governance of these institutions. And you know the European Investment Bank has this issue now because if it wants to be a climate bank, that's going to be different from how it's been operating until now and what does that literally mean for its, um, its own design. Yeah, absolutely. And and maybe um, just on, on your involvement in, in the just transition, obviously in Germany, we have this long tradition with the code determination and the workers' councils that actually um, we saw that yeah. during during the climate crisis, but also during the, the, the financial crisis, it was very often um, the worker councils presidents that had more forward-looking and more strategic views on, on the future of the companies than the shareholder value-oriented managers. And, yeah. and I think that was one of the, um, the good lessons of, of uh, 10 years ago. And, and we tapped into that um, this time again um, that we sat, sat together with um, both worker council representatives and um, the management. And that is when we developed the now world famous short term work allowance schemes um, as an automatic stabilizer. So Kurzarbeit, when Olaf Scholz back then was the uh, labor minister, he turned that tool into a crisis um, reaction tool. Now we had Kurzarbeit all along in, in Germany, um, but through this cooperation with both um, trade unions and worker councils and companies, um, we made sure that this was a, um, a, a tool that now, 10 years after the great financial crisis, we could just um, move to the shelf, take it out, um, and, and, and made it a, a tool that probably safeguarded uh, two to five million jobs only in Germany. And I saw all the follow laws and all these schemes that we saw in the US, in the UK, uh, and even made it part of the SURE program um, so that um, countries in the European Union that don't have it um, could could adapt it. I would be interested because um, I do see you know, and, uh, your examples, especially as a guy that comes from a city and, and, and was involved in city politics, I see how a mission-oriented approach would work there. Now, looking at the federal government and, and having experienced um, the silos that you mentioned, I think this is probably for, for the public sector and, and the governmental sector, um, the most challenging part, how to overcome these silos and how to make sure 
that ministries that have their own interests that um, are driven obviously by politicians that also want to um, be perceived as the ones that solve a problem that they actually um, work together um, and 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 work in a cooperative way um, and understand that that they also gained from such a mission um, centered approach and, and I don't know whether you have um, good examples of, of of countries where you say yeah look at this uh, that's where where they really got it yeah i mean one of the things we've done oh sorry were you going to say something? i just wanted to jump in but uh, there are actually lots of questions and just wanted to mention several of them are exact, exactly in this direction i mean it's difficult to summarize uh, many of them you already covered uh, but i think some of the questions were exactly the last point of wolfgang so let's imagine so we 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 we, we accept the approach we think it's good so let's suppose we want to implement it at a national level, not only. And so the, the German government, and I, I guess uh, then we had several questions sort of, do you think of a particular organizational structure for the national government? And then some uh, people, of course, being used to bureaucracy, how do you evaluate the performance of particular institutions? And, and how do you make sure that money is not wasted? Of course, we had those questions. So if, I mean, that's basically also the last point of Wolfgang. I just wanted to say lots of questions were in that direction. And then we had other questions, but I mentioned them later. They're more macro point of view, but let's go ahead. I just- Yeah, I mean, really good questions. And also, um, you know, Wolfgang, your, your last points. And one of, again, just coming back to the example. So first of all, I mean, most of my experience has been actually at the national um, level, the cities are simply interesting because city mayors have like really concrete things they need to do in terms of, you know, sewage and transport. So the ways of actually experimenting with new tools, new procurement um, methods or outcomes based budgeting or a local wealth fund is, is sometimes just easier at the city level just because it's, it's smaller and the ability to bring different stakeholders to the table in that participatory way is sometimes easier. This, by the way, is one of the reasons we've just founded a council for urban initiatives, which is co-hosted by UN Habitat, my institute and LSE cities to bring together city mayors on the back of COVID-19 because mayors found themselves on the front line, but without the resources. Um, and you know, ideas like outcomes-based budgeting and so on uh, are, are quite interesting. Anyway, back at the national level, one of the things that we've done with the UK government was to look at how they evaluate the public investments, right? So there's something called the green book uh, that's used. I'm sure every country has a different color for this. Um, and in the UK, this is basically where, you know, cost benefit analysis, net present value calculations are done. And the idea was if we do adopt this mission oriented approach, which um, with Theresa May's coalition government, um, we through the Institute helped them redesign their industrial strategy to be more mission oriented and less of just a list of sectors, which at the time were aerospace, aeronautics, life sciences, creative sectors and financial services. The idea was you know, set what the challenges are and get all your sectors, not just those random four sectors to work together. So the question for the Treasury was, how is that going to change the questions you're asking from the beginning? You know, which market failure should be fixed? No, the, the, the first question becomes a much more strategic one around what are the key problems and how do we then use the public budget and public investments to kind of go after them? But more specifically, what does it mean for how we evaluate outside of these kind of very uh, uh, static cost benefit and net present value calculations that are often done in the treasuries, which would have, as I argue in the book, stopped the moon landing from day one, had a cost benefit analysis been done because the risk of failure was so high. And yet what was so interesting with the moon landing was all the spillovers across the economy. So that need to have evaluation metrics, which actually capture those dynamic spillovers across the economy are really important. And yet we don't have that. We talk about maybe at best things like multipliers, the Keynesian multiplier for every euro of you know, public money, how much GDP is increased, but how that actually happens, the actual mechanism of crowding in other forms of finance precisely because the public sector can't do everything on its own really matters. And you know, dynamic spillovers across the economy are something that we need to know how to measure. So we've added that to uh, the Green Book to make it much more dynamic. But that really comes also down to this issue of you know, that new design of the tools themselves. I already just mentioned outcomes-based budgeting. What that means is you can't think if you have goals that you're gonna give a bit of money here, a bit of money there, and then stir it up and hope for the best. The goals themselves need to be reflected in how we do the budgeting. 
And this, of course, is really important in a region, Europe, where we've obsessed about deficits, forgetting that many countries, as I mentioned in the beginning, that cut their deficits for these kind of voodoo economic theories ended up having higher debt to GDP over time because they then had to pick up the mess later and weren't making those really important long term investments. Uh, but in terms of the organizational structure question, Tom, that you mentioned that was in the uh, um, in the chat or in the Q&A space. I think this is hugely important. This is why actually my own work began when I wrote The Entrepreneurial State in 2013 at the organizational level. The question was, you know, it's not only true that yes, everything that makes our iPhones smart and not stupid was publicly financed, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, but it was financed through mission-oriented, purpose-oriented organizations. DARPA did not invest in the internet because it wanted the internet. You know, there was no obsession like we have today with quantum computing, driverless cars. They had a problem. The problem was getting the satellites to communicate. GPS, same thing. The Navy didn't say, oh, we need GPS. They said, we need to know where all the ships are in the ocean. GPS was the solution. So how can we have a purpose problem outcomes oriented public institutions and then allow the growth, the technology, the productivity to kind of flow from that? was the culture, the culture of risk taking. So they actually measure their success, evaluate the other question performance on how much risk is actually being taken and how much economy wide um, uh, effects the successes have. So you don't always have to succeed. Of course, you'll fail and you can't penalize people for failure, as we often do with the civil service, where venture capitalists can brag about trial and error. And when a civil servant then does an error there in the front page of the newspaper, so that explicit welcoming of testing experimenting trial and error, but also then having an evaluation process of how much your success is, even though you might have to fail along the way, really stimulate that economy wide growth. So you're not just tinkering with little kind of gadgets. Um, but also, you know, like Italy, if I think of uh, an, the Italian case, which is, you know, not exactly one today of mission oriented public institutions on the back of having cut so much of our like we talk about la reforma della pubblica amministrazione, the reform of public administration, which has just ended up being cuts to the public administration. But in the early days, Italy had a very ambitious uh, state-owned enterprise called IDI, la istituzione della ricostruzione italiana. And it's a very interesting lesson in history because it had three phases, public, but not politicized, public, super politicized, where Alitalia, Rai, they all, you know, all parties got their hands in there and just kind of, you know, really hurt the ability of the institution to be dynamic, strategic, mission oriented. And then third phase, privatized, <laughs> which was completely tragic. Like when they privatized Telecom Italia, first thing, cut all the R&D. So it's a really interesting lesson because it's not about public or private. It's about how do we govern a public, dynamic, unpoliticized institution? which really has public goals at the center. Um, and you know, what are the metrics it requires? So one of the recent projects we've done in the Institute was with the BBC, because the BBC has always had these questions at its core, because it doesn't accept, if you think of BBC, not just news and BBC documentaries, which are globally known, but the BBC has also invested in soap operas and talk shows, which traditionally are seen for business. So a traditional public broadcaster like PBS in the US just does documentaries and high quality news and leaves the rest for business. Whereas the BBC by asking itself, we're public, we're a public kind of purpose oriented institution. What does it mean for the way we produce docu uh, sorry, soap operas and talk shows and the kinds of public value metrics and public purpose metrics that we need. And by having those discussions, they've been completely cutting edge and have produced world-class you know, soap operas like EastEnders, which is soap opera about the working class, not Dynasty in Dallas, about the, the 1%. I mean, that was a long time ago, but that ended up pushing the frontier of how we even understand the possibilities behind soap operas. So I know that's a bit of a random example, but it's a really important one because it shows that it's not just about public investment and kind of traditional or kind of catching up areas. It is about any format, literally, if you think of the TV format, but being really bold and asking questions around value and public value and diversity and participation through that if you're a public entity. And those kind of nitty gritty questions are really important in order you know, to get this right and the kind of culture of change also that was being asked in the Q&A.
good. Um, because there were a few macro questions, but before we move to the macro, actually, I, let me get back to Wolfgang actually with a point. You mentioned DARPA as a good example of uh, in the US how we fi uh, how fi uh, innovations are financed by the public sector, uh, investing in three four projects, knowing two or three will uh, I mean into four projects, knowing three might fail and one succeeds. So that seems to 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 what. Um, to the extent um, I, I have followed it, it seems very difficult in Germany to implement for all sorts of reasons. And, and Wolfgang mentioned we have something that 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 we Germany Germany had had some um, something created uh, the Institute for Jump Innovations, which was sought to be in that direction. So I'm um, going back to Wolfgang. What do you think is the likelihood that in the, with the new government we get something a little bit more like the DARPA, and then we go to the macro questions? I know you. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very good question. Actually, I had it written down here, um, asking Mariana about it, um, <laughs> well, and knowing it? DARPA, and 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 I think we have to see that I I strongly believe in past dependency. So to completely change course um, where you have well established institutions is is very complicated. I think you can you can do something, but you have to respect the path a country um, a public administration took. And I think what we tried with um, both the the agency for jump innovation and its uh, sister organization in, in the military is to copy a little bit of DARPA, obviously on a on a way um, smaller scale, and just to to give an idea how this could work. And and you might have heard that we had. A, a digital cabinet and a digital council that try to implement some of these ideas into uh, into into the ministries. Um, I would say with mixed success. So my feeling is from from the pre talks um, and and if you look at the programs of the three um, parties that might form a coalition, all of them. Are parties that have an approach that want to risk something, that want to go ahead, that have a, all different, but an idea of progress. So I'm I'm confident um, that we will come up um, with more interesting forms um, of, of governmental innovations, and and obviously the SPD um, will will stress this mission. Um, idea. Let's see how how the other two parties will react to that. So I'm 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 confident that we will achieve something there. I'm not clear yet, to be very honest, um, how it will look like. And 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 obviously um, that would be a great um, follow up question for Mariana to see whether you see that that a, a so well established institutions like DARPA. Where do you see countries that adapted something? that is working at, at, an, at, a, at a similar level and given the, 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 the German set of institutions that you very well know and, and the past we took, what kind of suggestion you would have for that new government. As I said, it's a unique moment because it really can make a difference now. Can I just say something about this? Because the UK is, is experiencing this. We had, um, I don't know if you follow UK politics, but someone called Dominic Cummings, who was the main advisor for uh, <laughs> for Boris Johnson. Let's not get into the whole Brexit debacle, but he was very much tied to that. And he ended up obsessing about DARPA. And now we have uh, an organization in the UK that's modeled around DARPA, but it's become like this thing in and of itself. I mean, the reason you need DARPA or DARPA type institutions in different areas, and you'll know that the UK the United States has ARPA E for energy on the back of the 800 billion stimulus package after the financial crisis. The first thing Obama did was bring in someone called Arun Ajumdar to run um, ARPA E and also to, to get a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, to run the Department of Energy within which kind of ARPA E was set because of this idea of directing the stimulus package, right? But that's why you need an ARPA E if you care to direct a stimulus package. Whereas if your big ambition is whether it's Brexit or, or, or something else in Europe, you don't necessarily need an, an ARPA E or an ARPA H or, or DARPA. So the first question is, what are we even trying to solve? What are our big ambitions? What's the vision? What's the strategy? And if you don't have one, and I would argue many European countries have no strategy or it's not a coherent strategy. You don't need a DARPA, you know, don't obsess about that. <laughs> so, you know, the big question is, 
what does a progressive party, you know, what is it fighting for? What are the challenges? How do we transform climate change, which is a really broad challenge into missions? And then of course you need DARPA type institutions. And it's not, you know, D Dominic Cummings went into this whole thing about we need more geeks in, in government. We need nerds in government. It's like, really? You think that's how NASA or, you know, ARPA or, you know, DARPA brought in smart people because they said, hey, geeks, we need you. No, it was an honor to work in DARPA or in ARPA-E because of the role that they had in steering investments, unfortunately in the past, mainly around military areas, but that kind of idea that you're at the center of value creation. You're not there just to fix markets, enable, facilitate Elon Musk, but actually make investments yourself. That makes it an honor. There's kind of mission mystique. And that's the point about debunking this notion of the civil service as at best facilitating and de-risking the cool risk takers in Silicon Valley. That's one of the first things that we need to kind of work at in order to even justify the need for such institutions. But I'm completely with you, Wolfgang. It's not about importing DARPA into Germany. It's about really saying, what are the kinds of institutions and mission-oriented institutions that we need for mission-oriented policies? And what does it mean for the existing institutions for how to transform them? Like I, I mentioned, Casa Depositi e Prestiti in Italy is a handout machine. It's a public bank that gives out money to, to sectors in crisis. How do you transform that institution instead of just bringing in a DARPA, transform a public bank into a more mission-oriented public bank? How do you transform the civil service in terms of how performance is done, uh, evaluated the question in the Q&A in order to allow that kind of experimentation? How do we have macro budgeting? I, I think, Tom, you said there's some macro questions that brings that kind of new way to even understand economic growth through kind of investment led strategic, you know, mission oriented policies as key to getting our kind of Keynesian multiplier uh, going. What is, you know, what does it mean for that? What does it mean for changing how we do cost benefit? What does it mean also for the negotiation? One of the things that DARPA does really well is negotiate. Even when they do health investments, which is so interesting, I studied this, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States put in $40 billion a year on health innovation. The prices of the drugs don't reflect that. The intellectual property rights don't reflect that. So they socialize risks, privatize rewards, right? So it fuels an innovation machine, but it doesn't fuel kind of equity because it ends up sort of being, you know, completely then taken advantage by the Pfizer's of this world. Whereas DARPA, when it funds health, because they do, because soldiers, you know, get sick on the battlefield, of course they don't, you know, how do you say, get taken advantage of, because they need to make sure that the soldiers get access to the medicines that DARPA helped to fund. So if you look at how they do procurement, how they do contracting, how they do advanced purchasing schemes and negotiate a good deal for the taxpayer, it's completely different. And that's that kind of level of confidence that we just unfortunately have lost within this kind of, you know, unfortunate neoliberal idea that, you know, all the, you know, value is created inside business and at best what the state can do is facilitate and enable that it's really hurt the confidence and the skills of getting a good deal um, just let me follow up with the macro the macro questions um, the there were kind of most of them i'm trying to summarize uh, three to four questions they went into the direction of debt financing of investment so uh, with all the investment needs, uh, in addition to the needs of, for expenditure for COVID-related uh, uh, expenditures, and uh, all the other goals we have are fiscal rules at the, uh, at the European level, or there were a couple of questions about Germany and the German debt break. I don't know whether you want to um, say something about that. Are that too tight? Should there be different? So I, I don't know if you want to say something about this, so that there were several questions about that. Maybe you can comment on, on, on the issue of um, fiscal rules, uh, fiscal policy in general, this sort of, uh, and the second set of questions was a little bit, uh, but I think we covered it uh, sort of, is the Green New Deal, the Green, the European Green Deal, an example of mission oriented, and it's a new deal, so we had that, but I, I guess, well, I'll leave it up to you to say whether it's a good example. And maybe I start with the, the political answer to the fiscal rules. <laughs> okay, um, so we definitely have to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, but also with uh, the disclaimer that uh, at the moment we are starting the negotiations for a new government. So 
um, everybody um, said that they would um, remain uh, silent about details of talks and I would like to adhere to that um, policy, obviously. But um, I think what you could see um, also now in this first paper um, as an outcome paper uh, for the negotiations, um, the three parties um, acknowledge that, uh, for example, the German debt rate does exist. It is um, deeply rooted in our constitution. In order to change it, you would need a two-third majority, not only in the Bundestag, but also in our second chamber, the Bundesrat. And if you look at majorities at the moment, um, this traffic light coalition would neither in the first chamber nor in the second chamber come near to two-third majority. And so um, I think um, people would need to live up to to the existing rules and make sure that we can make use of them. I think one of the most interesting um, developments um, in the Liberal Party was that uh, their leader, Christian Lindner, in the campaign said, um, we are not um, people who think that balanced budgets or the famous black zero are something that we need to follow. That is something that um, the conservatives um, still mentioned, even as their fetish. Um, and so I think that gives room, as you know, and some flexibility um, under the rules um, of, of the German debt break. And when it comes to the um, stability and growth pact, so the fiscal rules at the European level, um, the overall position that is stated in the document is also that it has proved flexibility and uh, that we would need to make use of that flexibility. Um, given the um, discussions that we saw on the European level, um, both within ECOFIN um, and um, at the leaders level, uh, I'd say that it will be very difficult to find majority uh, 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 unanimity for changing these rules. So my suggestion um, to, to everybody is um, look at the possibilities for making um, and, and, and using these rules in a flexible way um, rather than having endless discussions uh, on how to reform them. That, that is a good, um, it's an interesting thing. And, and I think there, there, there is plenty of room for, for, for thinking out improvements. But one should not forget um, political realities in that in that um, endeavor. I leave it there. It's it's a more diplomatic answer, but you can imagine how the discussions are going. So I mean, this whole area is the most um, the most full of myths now, and, and 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 I think there's a theoretical answer and a practical answer, and and the practical goes precisely to what Wolfgang I think is implying also in terms of the political. The theoretical answer, and I'm not going to give a whole lecture on this, <laughs> is what you know the folks in the U.S. have been talking about in terms of modern monetary theory. And I mean, and that's just a fact, which is we create money all the time. So you know, the fact you know governments are not the same thing as households. Households, of course, when they have very high debt and cannot pay it back, they go bankrupt. And by the way, this should be in the front page of every paper. So the level of private debt to disposable income globally. Um, is back at record levels. And that's what caused a financial crisis. You'd think we'd be talking about this. No one's talking about it. But anyway, for private debt, it's not the same thing as public debt. And public debt is different precisely because governments are not households. And a lot of the obsession about deficits and debt confuses the two. I'm not going to lecture you on that. Read the work of people like Stephanie Kelton. However, the practical does matter, right? So how you create money, and if we think about it in terms of European money creation through ECB, IB, and so on, matters. So if you're not expanding productive capacity, if it's just kind of money, kind of, as Keynes said, you know, digging ditches and filling them up again, and simply kind of, you know, trying to recover and create some employment, and then without actually expanding the structure of our economy and making it more productive, more able, um, but also, you know, the missions bit is even that's not enough, we need to steer it towards sustainable uh, solutions and so on. But even just talking about productive capacity, if you don't do that, then that can cause inflation. Right, because you end up having a static pie of kind of you know production and, and GDP, and more money is being created, and it, and it creates inflation. Whereas if you're expanding the pie 
and the green, and I'll kind of come to the green deal with this question, the green deal allows us to expand that pie with all new types of sectors and skills and ways of collaborations and public private partnerships around a greener economy, which literally means we need to do things differently, including new types of digital services for green economies. Denmark, by the way, is the number one provider of high tech green digital services to China. So a tiny, tiny country is the number one provider of green uh, high tech digital services. So that's, you know, that's expanding the pie of output of, of goods and services in a green direction. And if that is an outcome of also bold public policies, which in the short term increase our deficits, but in the long term transform our economies, it's, it's, it's not only interesting because it ends up also solving big problems, but ironically, it also reduces debt to GDP because it's expanding that denominator. And there's so much ignorance. I mean, there's so much ignorance in this area where people confuse deficits with debt to GDP, the short run with the long run and so on. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons I accepted to, so Dr. Tedros asked me to run a council for the World Health Organization around the economy. We've called it the WHO Council on the economics of health for all is, is very much based on these questions because it's not that economies haven't thought about health. They've just thought about it with the reverse logic. <laughs> the logic has been, well, there's all these things we need to invest in like public education and public health, and that's also good for the economy. And then the economic structures we set up aren't actually related to that. So the question we ask in this council, and we're really urging the G20 now in a new brief that's about to come out, which I'll send you Wolfgang, <laughs> send me your email. Um, is saying, think of the goal, right? So if the goal is health for all, and that's the WHO goal, World Health Organization, backtrack and ask, what does it mean for the economy? So instead of saying invest in health because it's good for economic growth, invest in health for all, and what that actually means in all sorts of more granular ways, including the vaccine for everyone, but also specifically, you know, healthcare services, how to organize them, health innovation in terms of the IPR and so on. Invest in health for all and backtrack on what it means for all the different types of economic structures, the macro budgeting, the public private partnerships, the design of those, the design of our development banks and promotional banks, the design of procurement policy. So all these economic tools need to be designed with that goal in mind. And for the WHO, this is extremely important in terms of its contribution to the world stage right now, where unfortunately, what we're hearing also by the philanthropies and different organizations is just put in a lot more money, put in more money for vaccines, more money into healthcare without saying, well, hold on, maybe part of the problem has been that the structure of the finance, the structure of the economies needs to be transformed. You can't just, again, throw a lot of money at a problem and hope for the best. And in terms of the Green Deal, absolutely, you know, that has to be a macroeconomic strategy. And that's exactly what I mean by let's make sure the green missions aren't siloed at the national level in the Department of Energy or Environment, at the EC level in the DG environment. It has to go to the center of the cabinet, to the center of the finance ministry, to the center of the treasury and ECFIN and the cabinet itself in terms of how we steer economic growth in that way that, again, Obama tried to do. Uh, steering the fiscal stimulus back in um, after the financial crisis, because all of a sudden that starts to force you to ask questions like, oh, well, what does it mean for the structure of these institutions on the ground that are going to help steer and direct that finance? It can't be done with old style static uh, institutions and siloed institutions. So the Green Deal as a moment to focus not just on the rate of growth, but the direction of growth and to again remember that the structural composition of the organizations on the ground really matter and that includes the business community as Wolfgang said which many businesses continue to be wed just to shareholder value what does it mean for that kind of stakeholder value and experience that countries like Germany have had in terms of workers on the board and so on to help steer the discussions and the direction of growth but also the negotiation of how rewards are shared uh, but also, I really think that we need to be reviving our understanding of other types of organizations like cooperatives. We have a project in the Biscay region of Spain, which, as you know, has a Mondragon, a huge cooperative, 87,000 workers. What is really the kind of different ways of structuring corporate governance, public governance, public private partnerships at the core of a Green Deal, which on the macro side, we create that fiscal space because we create it in war times. We create it now with the coronavirus recovery, you know, four to six trillion in the US, 
two trillion in Europe just years after we said there was no money. So money is created, it's created for wars. What do we, does it mean to both create that fiscal space, but then get our hands dirty on the ground on the structures, the tools, the instruments that are needed, and they must be transformed because you can't be ambitious on the macro side with old instruments on the ground. Okay, great. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, maybe just time for one last question. So let me try, try to tie loose ends in, in, in a sense and also summarizing again, I'm, I'm always looking at the, the questions you can I'm trying to get the, um, as much back into the conversation. So we, we uh, talked a lot and we had lots of questions about the organizational structure and, and also there were questions, how do we change policymakers mindset, I should tell you, maybe you want to say. Uh, but I think this is what we are doing and what you are doing, Mariana, all the time is changing the mindset. So, but maybe you want to add that. So um, we had a lot of discussion about the organizational issues that show up, we, how we could maybe overcome them. And then um, we had the macro discussion about deficit, maybe deficits financing and is there enough money to finance all these things. So let me push you a little bit. Uh, um, the, the way I'm, would you think, what's the biggest obstacle now if you had to choose between the two? <laughs> Uh, for Europe, for Europe or Germany to implement your ideas, is it really maybe changing the organizational structure, or is it really? I mean, keeping in mind that 2022 we still have an exemption to the deficit rule in Germany and Europe, so it, it would be only in 23, 24 where it would be binding. Is it really the financial issue, but which worries you the most, meaning the fiscal tightening which might come in the future, or is it more the the uh, while well, implementing the idea needs a new mindset, needs a new organization, new institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, well, I mean, yeah, right? I mean. I hope you're wrong about the fiscal tightening because it would be so, I'm sorry to be rude, but idiotic uh, because we know now, even the IMF and the World Bank have opened up to this, right? There's working papers coming out of the IMF saying, oh, whoops, we screwed up, sorry. <laughs> we shouldn't have been imposing austerity that just has actually created secular stagnation and so on globally. So that doesn't work. We know fiscal tightening doesn't work. It's crazy that that's still even on the table. But it also doesn't work to just say flood the system with public money, helicopter money and hope for the best. No. So I think the obstacle is one, please get over the hang up about the fiscal tightening. It is based on completely you know, wrong theory and leads to very problematic practice. And in the long run, ironically, actually ends up increasing debt to GDP because you have to pick up a lot of the mess in a in a reactive way instead of having a proactive stance on public budgets but then the other mind i mean the other bottleneck is the kind of storytelling that you mentioned the mindset and you know i i opened my other book not the mission book the value book called value of everything with the quote by plato who said storytellers rule the world <laughs> and i'm seeing this today the pushback by big pharmaceutical companies on any type of regulation about the intellectual property rights around vaccines but any sort of health innovation including remdesivir, a drug that somehow has costed, you know, thousands to the taxpayers that helped to fund it. Um, the storytelling of where value comes from and where wealth comes from. And, and if I may, Wolfgang, the SPD, like many progressive parties, needs to get its hands more active on a, on a narrative, a discourse, a story about wealth creation. It can't just be about redistribution, it, as, as many, you know, social Democrats have had around the world. Um, you know, that is very important and we need progressive tax policy and we need to, you know, have a strong welfare state and so on. But if we don't have a really dynamic and innovative way to talk about where does value come from and how innovation is a result of collective uh, uh, um, investments and therefore we need to have those DARPA type conversations within a progressive kind of uh, um, program, then we lose the battle. And you know the battle has to be about governing our system in order to meet goals, not just on the investment side, but also on the regulatory side. And if you look at what's happening with big tech, I'm surprised we haven't even mentioned the word yet, but digital platforms and big tech, it's just the complete failure of knowing how to govern a system where the technology itself is an outcome of public money, and then we forgot to govern it for the public good. So reviving the notion of the common good and the public good to be a real objective and not just a correction for something that someone else isn't doing with a filling the gap mentality. I think that's also really, really important. So I would say getting over the voodoo economics, which has led to fiscal tightening that even the IMF realizes is wrong. That's the first challenge and please do that. And, and second, 
getting one's hands dirty with the narrative and the, and the discourse about value creation. And third, everything else we've been talking about, which is then transform those tools on the ground that actually create, you know, a strategic uh, uh, growth that fosters economy-wide and sector-wide investment and innovation, which again requires that kind of social contract at the center, those conditionalities at the center of how public and private actually relate. And on some of these, Germany is actually very much ahead of the game. And on some, like fiscal tightening, it's completely behind the game. Okay. Well, even though I would say on, on fiscal tightening, I think you, you would see that this government, um, even with the conservatives, has changed course a lot. And not only in Europe, and the now finance minister and maybe future chancellor always said that um, we should not um, return to austerity after the crisis. So that is um, at the core. And if you look at what we did on the international level, <clears throat> I, I think you can see a clearly different approach, not only in Europe, but also internationally. So the SDR allocation of 670 billion euro gave fresh money to many countries so to give them space to breathe. Um, our DSSI and the common framework on debt release and, 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 and restructuring should hopefully help. And we always, together with the IMF and the World Bank, stress that we need more investment and, and try to make sure that this is happening. Obviously, it's a long way and it's complicated. Um, and, and maybe even such a thing like um, the, the international global minimum tax that um, we developed together with the French and we just adapted um, at the OECD and G20 level um, might help to inject some money um, that can then be used. And also it helps hopefully to level the playing field a little bit when it comes to digital platforms. That's, that's another story then. But maybe to Tom's question, because before my job here at the ministry, um, I used to work for seven years in the city state of Hamburg, being responsible for Europe. And so I had to oversee um, all the European programs, and we are the tiniest um, European program on structural um, and, and regional development. And I can just tell you, the devil is in the detail. So um, whenever I hear all these macro debates, I still remember my time in Hamburg trying to figure out how to make best use of back then it was only 35 million over a seven year period of that European money. And if I look into many of um, the projects that were done in Hamburg, but also in Italy and in many places, beautiful names, beautiful projects, beautiful websites. But if you check these websites five years of the ending of the program, there's nothing left. Um, so I do think um, as Mariana would have put it, um, we have to make our hands dirty and get into um, the real muddy business <clears throat> on the ground and, and actually make this money work in the best way possible. And, and my feeling is that this was not and is not always the case, to be, to be very um, frank. And so it's, I think it's, it's both elements, actually. As, as it is the case in so many um, situations, we have to understand in politics that the the complexity of, of, of this world, we can't reduce it and we have to deal with all the things at the same time. Um, that's, that's the difficult thing, but that's also the beauty of it. Yeah. There's a Project Syndicate article I've, I've just written about how you know, the challenges are about moving away from a Washington consensus view about a lot of these questions. And because the G7 happened in Cornwall and I, represented Italy and uh, uh, you had a wonderful uh, German representative through uh, Stormy. Um, we talked about a Cornwall consensus. And I think, you know, unfortunately, I think, or I shouldn't say unfortunately, what we need for the G20 to do is to really take seriously all the questions we've just talked about, which is, yes, we need more money for climate. Yes, we need more money for health. And there's some really interesting proposals around uh, uh, health systems globally now on the back of the G20. Um, conference, but if we don't then transform the institutions, the instruments, the organizations and the deals, um, the global deals in terms of including WTO deals in terms of the TRIPS waiver. And, and by the way, Germany has been a bit problematic around these intellectual property right issues. I don't know why. We can talk why. about that on another why? Uh, occasion. Why? <laughs> I could tell you. <laughs> anyway, whatever, but please change that too. Um, if we don't transform those things, then this is, again, a real wasted opportunity. So we argue from a Washington consensus to a Cornwall consensus and, 
and both COP26 and G20 will be the testing grounds because we can't continue to just talk. We got to walk the talk. Okay, great. Thank you. So that's also a nice closing statement, Cornwall consensus. We need a new consensus uh, moving us in a new direction. So I, I thank everyone. I thank Mariana and, and Wolfgang for really stimulating an insightful discussion. I, I, I thank the audience for staying with us and uh, sending us lots of questions. I'm, I'm, really, I'm looking at 30 plus questions. So um, I'm, I apologize if I couldn't ask every question. I tried to summarize them a little bit. I'm also supposed to mention that next week, Thursday, uh, the Forum New Economy, we have a big workshop coming up. So please join us again. And so thank you again to everybody and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.